inaugural seminar of the semester. It's uh, the last few years we've been starting off the seminar series by having Christian. Uh, is the mic working? Give talks about their research, their labs research, their testing research. <clears throat> and uh, today we have five speakers. Five of the faculty are, are speaking today. Uh, if you look at the schedule, it's a little bit disjointed. So we have three <laughs> talks in the morning. Then we have a very long lunch break. <laughs> and then we have uh, two talks in the afternoon starting at 3.30. So don't think that it's over in the morning and go home and enjoy your weekend. We do have four <laughs> talks this afternoon. So well, we also have, don't we have a barbecue at a... And there's a barbecue yes, for MSAC, the inaugural MSAC. And then there's also, I think, a food truck rally. <laughs> so, I mean, you have the opportunity to get stuck yourself today. Uh, and listen to some really good, interesting... Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so we need water. Uh, uh, <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm going to read the title because I assume that if you're in graduate school, you all can read. <laughs> so, uh, Ernst. Thanks, Don. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a, an overview of the structure of the research in my lab. And uh, I showed this during the last faculty seminar. But I'll be talking about a different part of it this time. Um, part is outlined here. And it involves the use of natural tags to reconstruct geographic and trophic histories of individual marine animals. Um, I'll be talking about a lot of students' work, but I also need to mention that some of the, my students aren't involved in this section outlined in red. Uh, uh, Brianna uh, Michaud, got her name right, <laughs> and Jeremy Browning are in this quadrant over here. And also I need to mention that a number of uh, Dr. Stiling's students, uh, Joe Curtis, Ori Sadiq, Ben Kurth are using some of these methods that I'll be describing as well. And Dr. Stallings has started to incorporate some of the methods into his proposals. Uh, the funding for this has been fairly diverse. NOAA, USGS, FWC, NOAA through private consultants as part of the NERDA process, and recently Sea Image 2 in uh, collaboration with the Morosky Hollander Labs, and also Moat Marine. <clears throat> so why natural tags? Sorry for the word slide. You can just read the bold letters. Um, they, they cover entire lifespans, whereas when you use artificial tags, such as coated wire or a plastic attachment or um, even the electronic implants, things like that, they only cover part of the life. And they're very good for obtaining behavioral detail, for example. Uh, on, a, on an hourly or daily, uh, weekly basis. Uh, but uh, the electronic attachments generally don't stay implanted throughout the entire life. In fact, a lot of these artificial tags simply cannot be used on very small organisms, whereas the natural tags cover the entire lifespan. The natural tags are 100% effective. Every, every fish or organism that you look at is going to have the information recorded within it, whereas Artificial tags, especially if you're using conventional tags, you'll have a return of less than 10% typically. Uh, so you may, I, I read of one study just recently where they tagged 18,000 dolphin fish and only got 500 back. So that's just a two or three per hundred. And that's very expensive to do that. Um, you can also get the natural tag information from discards. So you really, in, in our case, I'll be talking about <coughs> otoliths and eye lenses. And uh, you can literally get those out of you know, the, the, what people throw away after they've cleaned a fish. So you're not, you don't necessarily have to kill fish to do this type of work. <coughs> also, you have the body when you're finished. So you can decide what kind of information you want to extract from that body. You can get information on, on the growth rate history of a fish or 
uh, its sex and reproductive state. You think about with an artificial tag, if you catch a fish, you may not know what sex it is. You put a tag in it. A fisherman returns the tag sometime later, if you're lucky, and you still don't know the sex of the fish. When you have the, the body, you can, you can determine the reproductive state. Uh, you can measure toxic body burdens, such as PAHs from oil. Uh, if you have the viscera, and, so, and almost always you have some muscle attached to the head, even if the fish has been filleted. So this, the expense of using natural tags is therefore kind of controllable. You can, do, you can decide what kind of information you want to uh, extract from your samples. And if it's not that detailed, it, the approach can also be very rapid. You don't have to wait for people to return tags over a period of years. Um, there, so they're inherently retrospective perspectives on what the fish has been doing in terms of its habitat. And uh, you don't have synoptic information a lot of times when there's an event like Deepwater Horizon. It wasn't as if there were a whole lot of tagged fish that people could go out and collect uh, in order to assess the impacts. You know, programs just uh, aren't as extensive as people outside the fisheries um, industry might expect them to be. <clears throat> so uh, case in point, um, starting out with uh, our progress looking for uh, an oil spill signature in fish otoliths, their ear bones. Um, this is Jen Graneman, a PhD student, and most of the, uh, the next series of slides will be her work. But, uh, she could not have made the progress she's made without the help of these two. Dr. David Jones, who's the technical lead on the microchemistry project. He's also the instructor for our courses in biometry and applied multivariate statistics. And also Dr. Kelly Deister, who uh, runs the ICPMS lab for Dr. Byrne. The first part, after you extract the otoliths, which only takes a couple of minutes, um, they get cleaned and then sectioned with stacked blades so that you get several sections. This is a, an image of a section taken out of this uh, series of cuts, and you can pick the one that comes closest to the core of the three that you get from a, a single cut with uh, stacked blades. It, it may require uh, two-part epoxy to stabilize the sample, especially if it's small or fragile. <clears throat> and then once the sections are mounted, they uh, get cleaned and m more processing. And that, at that point, you have to start worrying about contamination, so everything's done using clean methods uh, under a uh, clean bench with ceramic plastic tools, trace metal grade gloves and uh, a lot of careful attention to cleanliness of everything. Once the samples are ready, they go to the burn lab <coughs> where we have <coughs> a laser ablation system hooked up to the ICPMS. It's easy to switch back and forth between laser-based uh, samples and, for example, liquid-based ones. And <coughs> that involves uh, laser traveling across the surface of the otolith section. And this is a, an SEM shot of what that aftermath looks like. So this is 50 microns. This is the surface of a section from an otolith. And these ridges in here are the equivalent of daily growth rates. So as the fish grows, the, the otolith gets progressively larger. And you can actually see daily growth rings. And to give you some idea, We've actually inadvertently sampled the same day three times, for example, just by having too high of a frequency of data collection. <coughs> we don't need to know chemistry three times a day. This is an example of actual data running across a transect. The transect is uh, drawn right here. The center of the core is hatching, and the outer margin is capture. So that's only a couple of millimeters. And this distance here is two millimeters. It can be several millimeters. It depends on the size of the otolith, which varies among species, and the age of the fish. 
but typically we're working with a couple of millimeters, two or three, four maybe. And uh, this element shown here is barium, which is an indicator of freshwater discharge. So this particular fish, which is a, a red snapper, spent its early life in the northern Gulf in association with the outflow from the Mississippi River. And then it was caught over here. So it appears to have moved to an area that didn't have so much river influence. We actually have 26 analytes, 25 if you consider that calcium is the matrix that you saw in this. It's a aragonite, cal calcium carbonate. Um, and so the, it's stoich stoichiometrically around 40% of the total. So it's used as an internal standard. We also have a, a series of external sa uh, standards that are used. <coughs> So that leaves uh, 25 analytes after you subtract the calcium. And of those uh, with the oil spill, we wanted to know which ones were associated with the oil, which elements, which analytes. And so this uh, convenient paper by Liu et al. Uh, came out and they identified the dominant trace metals in the actual oil, not, not the moose. The moose is over here, but this is the the oil straight from the well. And so these analytes, a couple of them were not detected, uh, manganese and arsenic. But uh, you can see all the rest of these we were able to measure. Aluminum is not reliably measured by our ICPMS setup. Uh, but the rest of them, you can see nine analytes there. <coughs> we did copper twice. There are two isotopes of copper that we look at. And this is a, a somewhat complex plot, but what each, we have the oil associated metals here, and then each of these columns is an average value from a year in the life of the fish. So the otoliths, you can see the annuli, just like tree rings. So we know how to organize the data. It's not a calendar year, it's usually spring to spring. It's not you know, January 1st to January 1st. So um, each of these is a, a, a year in the life and an average uh, metal value. And there are a lot of interesting things that come out of this. We, we use a multivariate procedure called SIMPROF to classify these into groups. And um, so in this case, the SIMPROF procedure found a very large group here that it didn't divide, and then two smaller groups. And you can see the relative amount of the different metals in the different specimens. Uh, everything's been standardized. It's as a percentage of the total so that uh, all of the metals show up with the same magnitude. Otherwise, everything would be drowned out by iron. Iron's the most abundant metal in the otolith. And incid incidentally, iron is physiologically regulated. You see how uniform it is across the entire, you know, all of the samples have about the same value. So uh, when you're looking at an otolith, it's not <coughs> a, a rock in, in a natural environment. There's a lot of control over what gets deposited. <coughs> and in this case, the iron is, is, is very much regulated. And you also see that uh, there were some specimens that had a fair amount of chromium and vanadium. Vanadium is an indicator of combustion of oil, hydrocarbons. <coughs> and then over here, you've got a lot of uh, zinc and, and nickel in this group. <coughs> and this group has a lot of copper. The zinc and nickel are correlated. That's this dendrogram here tells you how much the different metals co-occur. Co and so you can see nickel and zinc tended to co-occur, and they're in that group over there called group B. This is our so-called clean group, although in this case we've got some, uh, the statistics did not pull out these two as being different. A lot of times they do. So here's a re-plotting of the same data. Each one of the symbols equates to one of those columns. And the groups are circled. You can see that so-called clean group actually has a couple of subgroups in it that are those vanadium and chromium fish. This is the true clean 
area right here. And this is the high copper group. And this is the group that had uh, the nickel and zinc in it. And then superimposed on this passively are letters that indicate whether or not the fish had visible disease. Disease in the form of fen rot, lesions, too many parasites. Those have a Y on them. So this group that had the nickel and zinc also, again, passive labels on that group, not part of the computation, was dominated by diseased fish. And even these two here, these were two diseased fish that may have Ys over them. Um, you know, they're very close in multidimensional space to the disease group. And I would bet that the ones that were not diseased, they're kind of, kind of to the left side of this, had been exposed, but just weren't showing any kind of external disease as a result. <coughs> so uh, how clean are our so-called clean groups? Uh, student Brock Houston has been looking at this. It's only one part of his thesis he'll be defending shortly. Um, he used pre-Columbian otoliths to address this question. So Native Americans catch and eat fish and they throw the remains away into what are called middens. And uh, this is a midden site at Whedon Island being excavated by USF archaeologists and they find otoliths. And they identify them to their credit. They can identify the otoliths to species. And also while they're excavating very carefully, they'll encounter old charcoal from the fires that were used to cook the fish. And they can date the charcoal. So they believe that the otoliths they recovered from this site were uh, deposited sometime between 855 and 1220 uh, AD. So that's about 800 years ago, long before th the Industrial Revolution or even European contact with this area. So gratifyingly, this section, those of you in the front can actually see the laser transect in that red box. Um, that data from that transect fell right into one of our clean groups for this species. This is red drum, which is very, very nice. The rest of that otolith has undergone diagenesis. Uh, it's been subjected to acid rain, and it looks like the aragonite, which is ordinarily clear, uh, has been replaced by calcite. And it also has a lot of vanadium in it from the local power plant burning, that used to burn oil. So we can determine if the fish were exposed, but the argument, especially if you're kind of in a legal position, is uh, where were they exposed? Fish swim, so sure, you found some exposed. And then also, if you just find some exposed fish off your coast, you're going to want to know if they were exposed locally or if they swam to your coast. So the second part of uh, the investigation involves this. And um, the terrestrial biologists use isotope maps called isoscapes to study individual organism migration. It, it, it's been applied to birds a lot, but also mammals and even insects. And they can determine where and when individual animals um, occupied different habitats. Problem is we don't have these isoscapes for marine ecosystems. I was at a meeting in, in Germany a couple of years ago and the keynote speaker said we need more marine isoscapes. It was, that was great because we already were on it. We, were, we had uh, uh, Kara Radabaugh had already started collecting isoscapes using trawl data. Um, <coughs> she's since graduated. This is just one of her isoscapes. It's for a particular species, dusky flounder, and it was repeated uh, in summer of two different years and also again in the fall to see if there was a seasonal variation. And over and over, not just with this species, but with lots and lots of species, we see this pattern of, of nitrogen increasing this way and uh, carbon increasing this way. And those two trends are orthogonal to each other which is a very important point. They're not correlated. 
So uh, we had a, a, a reason to expect that this was simply river water as an end member and then uh, nitrogen from nitrogen fixation, which is ultimately atmospheric in origin down here and that it was just a mixing situation. Uh, so the, we believe that the, um, the nitrogen pattern just match, matches this mixing from river, of river water with nitrogen from cyanobacteria. The carbon took a lot more work to try to explain, and it turns out that the, the carbon uh, patterns match fish communities really well. That was a principal finding from Sherry Hulster's thesis uh, she defended this summer. Uh, the, ba the, the communities separated out as having different basal resources. In other words, the primary producer that was supporting their biomass was different. And those primary producers, whether it's phytoplankton, benthic algae, have, are dependent on the light environment. So benthic algae need more light than phytoplankton. And uh, this ultimately, this gradient this way, we believe is uh, strongly tied to the light environment and its effect on whether the fish biomass is derived from micro benthic microalgae or planktonic microalgae. So next, once we had the isoscapes, we needed to have some kind of internal record of the isotopes. Uh, we knew that you know, nit nitrogen was a critical part of the story, but there's very little nitrogen in otoliths. So uh, we started looking for alternatives. Bone, you would think, is very stable, but it's not. It's vascularized. The collagen, which is the structural protein in it, gets replaced with time, and so you actually see turnover in the isotopes through time, so it's not conservative. And finally, vertebral uh, cartilage works well, uh, but there are not that many species that have vertebral cartilage. It's only the ancestral fishes, sharks, rays, and a few other groups that have vertebral cartilage, whereas most of the 28,000 species on the planet do not have uh, vertebral cartilage. Uh, for a while, Amy, Amy Wallace was um, busy trying to figure this out, and this is, she's up in uh, Oregon in a freezer looking at a white sturgeon, which is one of the few species that has both a cartilaginous vertebra, uh, vertebral column, and otoliths. Sharks don't have otoliths, rays don't have otoliths. So we were going to try to link these things together. Uh, that was our first attempt. This is uh, her literally two days ago on the weather bird with a big tile fish that they caught. Uh, but ultimately, after checking a lot of things, we ended up on settling on